Polymer Solution Theory, a series of lectures by Professor George Phillies, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Lecture 1, Segmental Dynamics from Dielectric Relaxation. Based on the paper, Polymer Segmental Cross Correlations from Dielectric Relaxation Spectra of Block Copolymers, a paper by Professor George Phillies, published in Physical Review E, Volume 84, Paper 011807, 2011. First, a little organic chemistry leading to the observation that a polymer chain may have an associated dipole moment. In fact, it has three sorts of dipole moments as discussed by Stockmeyer and Bauer. I remind physicists in the audience that typical polymer chains are covalently bonded. A typical pair of covalently bonded atoms is the C double bond O group in the lower left of the figure. In organic molecules, electrons can dis redistribute themselves along covalent bonds, so in a typical situation of the sort shown in the lower left of the figure, the carbon will tend to be somewhat positively charged and the oxygen will tend to be somewhat negatively charged, giving a net dipole moment to the organic group that's being shown here. How does that turn out for a whole polymer molecule? On the right of the figure, we show very schematically a polymer molecule. The black vertical line represents the polymer chain's backbone. The horizontal lines represent the side chains that are attached to the backbone at some point. And the three arrows labeled C, B, and A represent three sorts of dipole moments associated with the actual atoms, which you can't see in this very schematic figure. The type C, the red arrow, represents the dipole associated with a side group, the part of the dipole moment associated with the side chain that is free to move when the side chain rotates around its axis. That is, the side chain rotates around the line of the gr one of the green lines, uh, the red arrow moves from up to horizontal to down, and as it does so, and it will do so due to thermal motions of the molecule, the, that section of the dipole moment of the polymer chain forgets which way it was pointing. The B, the green arrow, represents the part of the dipole moment of the side chain that points parallel to the bond that attaches the side chain to the main chain of the polymer. In order for that bond to be and to move in order for that dipole moment to forget which way it was pointing, we have to rotate that bond around its axis and that's done because the polymer chain can rotate using the black vertical line as an axis until the green B arrow, instead of pointing to the right, points to the left. As it does so, because the polymer chain is typically doing a crankshaft sort of motion, what happens is that the B dipole moments are relaxed. And this occurs on, just as the C is relaxed on a fairly short time scale. Finally, it could be the case that the polymer chain has a net dipole moment that points along its long axis. This occurs because the individual groups in the side chain have dipole moments and the polymer chain as a whole has a net asymmetry. Now getting such a net asymmetry is not trivial. Only if the molecule is an ABC, ABC or more complex repeated arrangement can you get a net dipole moment pointing along the backbone. Uh, how do you relax those, ba those pieces? Well, the vector A actually points from one end of the chain to the other, and in order to relax that vector A, there are two possibilities that will be shown in the next slide. Let us consider the part of the dipole moment that lies along the chain axis. 
On the left of the slide, the thin red line, the irregular line, is a symbolic representation of a polymer chain as it winds through solution. The black arrows represent the dipole moments of pieces of the chain, the component of the dipole moment that actually lies along the chain axis. For simplicity here, I've only shown four of them, the four black arrows. P sub 1, then, upper left, is the dipole moment of the first piece of the chain. The total dipole moment is indicated by the blue arrow, it's P at time t, and is indicated by the equation P is the sum of the P sub i multiplied by the thetas. We'll come back to the thetas and the green arrow in a few moments. First though, let's ask, how can that vector, capital P, the dipole moment of the total chain, change? Go to the right side of the slide. The black arrow indicates the initial value of the dipole moment of the chain, P of 0. As time goes on, P of 0 is a vector. It has two possibilities for changing itself. One possibility is that it changes its direction in space, indicated by the red arrow pointing off to the lower right. That corresponds to end over end rotation of the polymer chain as a whole. Changes in the shape of the polymer chain, changes in the position of those little red zigs and zags on the left figure, that do not change the position of the two end points, do not change the the polymer chain's dipole moment. You actually have to move one endpoint with respect to the other to do that. However, there's a second way the polymer chain can change its dipole moment, indicated by the second red arrow, the one parallel to the black arrow. The second red arrow corresponds to the chain getting larger or smaller, chain breathing, while the dipole moment continues to point in the same direction. Chain breathing is an expansion and contraction mode. Chain rotation is rotational diffusion. There seem to be two different time-dependent processes that might contribute to the time dependence of P. Final point. That green arrow on the left, what is it? Well, polymer chains have to be synthesized one unit after the next, somehow or the other. But if you are a very clever organic chemist, and there are several Japanese groups we'll credit in the next slide with this, you take the polymer chain and you stick in part of the chain back to front so that you, in essence, reach into the polymer chain, slice out a section, and reinsert it backwards. And now the total dipole moment of the chain becomes the sum of the three black arrows minus, because it's pointing backwards, the green arrow. That plus or minus, depending on which way you stick in each piece of the polymer chain, is the letter theta in the one equation on this figure. How do we measure the dielectric moment of a single chain? The answer is we can't. We have to do something slightly more indirect. There's actually a very large literature on this, and I would be amiss if I did not acknowledge the central role of professors K. Adachi and H. Watanabe, whose research groups and collaborators have done so much to advance this field. The short answer is that we use dielectric relaxation. I'll give you a simple image of the experiment. We have a parallel plate capacitor, therefore we can measure its capacitance. If we apply a voltage to it, we can determine how much charge is on the capacitor plate. There are some minor electrical engineering details that I'm skipping. If I apply an oscillating uh, voltage across the plates, the charge on the plates also oscillates. Now, I could do this with vacuum between the plates. That's one experiment. Or I could fill the space between the plates with a polymer solution. If I do that with the polymer solution and I apply an electric field at different frequencies, I discover that the charge I store on the plate not only in magnitude depends on the frequency, but doesn't necessarily pile up exactly in phase with the voltage. The relationship between the charge and the applied voltage gives you a dielectric constant, but it's not a constant. It's a frequency-dependent complex number.
What are we actually measuring? The first answer is that we are measuring a correlation function, the dipole-dipole correlation function indicated in the first equation. The first equation says that we look at the ensemble average of p of 0 dot p of t. Those braces represent the ensemble average. The correlation function answers a simple question. If at one instant the vector p is pointed in one direction with one magnitude, what happens to it on the average at later times? And the correlation function answers that question. Phi of t, the correlation function, is determined by the correlation function p sub i of 0, p sub j of t. That's the rightmost part of the equation. That is, the correlations between the positions of different parts of the chain at different times. Now I said we vary the frequency, and that's because you often do these experiments not in time domain as implied by phi of t, but in frequency domain as implied by the complex dielectric constant, second equation, which is a function of frequency and which is related to a time transform, a time Fourier transform of phi of t. That's what we actually measure. The additional experiments proposed in this paper are based on the ingenious experiments of Adachi and Watanabe. Their experiments are indicated by the three figures at the center of the slide. On the left, we see the simple dielectric experiment in which the chain has the same composition everywhere and the sum of the type A dipoles of the chain points from one end of the chain to the other. The dielectric relaxation then determines the time correlation function of the indicated blue arrow, the end-to-end -end vector, giving us, for example, end-over-end -end rotation times and mean square distances between ends of the chain. There are two ways to advance beyond this. The first is to say we will go into each chain and replace half of it that's the light blue line, with something that is chemically sort of consistent with the dark red part, but which is dielectrically neutral. Because it is dielectrically neutral, it does not contribute to the total dipole moment of the chain, and the dielectric relaxation experiments center image then determine the relaxation of the vector between the middle of the chain or wherever and one end and we are now looking at the dynamics of some piece. An alternative is to say we will go into this chain, the red chain, we will slice half of it off and we will reattach it end to end so that the two type A dipole sums are correctly indicated by the blue and red arrows on the right. The blue and red arrows each show a vector pointing from an end of the chain into the middle. The total dielectric vector is the sum of those two arrows and we are in some sense looking at the relationship between how one end and half of the chain moves and the other half of the chain moves. In addition, because we are using the same chemical compound for both halves of the chain. We've just flipped which way we've stuck it into the larger polymer. We don't face the challenge that is faced in the center figure where the light blue part of the chain is a different in chemical nature from the red part of the chain with indeterminate necessarily effects on how the red chain moves. So there is the new experiment where you either cause part of the chain to be dielectrically neutral or you cause part of the chain to be point backwards and you ask what you can pull out on the dynamics. And now we have reached my experiment. Underlying it is a very challenging piece of synthetic organic chemistry. Namely, the objective is to make four polymers that are almost identical. They are almost identical except they contain two segments in the center and the two segments in the center are inserted into the polymer in the four possible combinations of directions. The th in the picture, the three green segments are the same in all four polymers. 
The two blue segments with the green and red arrow above and below are inserted with alternative orientations. For clarity, we'll call the left segment A and the right segment B. When the segment is inserted facing rightwards, that's the green arrows, we use capital letters A, B to identify it. When the segment is inserted the other direction, we use the red arrow for the direction, and that's little a and little b. So since there are four combinations of left and right facing for the two segments, there are actually four polymers here. We now measure their dipole-dipole correlation function, their dielectric relaxation function, and we form a specific combination of those functions, being very careful to get the normalizations right so that everything adds properly. When we do that, we get the top equation, which is the sum of two of the quantities, minus the sum of two of the other quantities. And we end up with something very remarkable shown in the bottom equation. The bottom equation shows that we get a dipole-dipole correlation function in which we get a correlation between dipoles I, which are in segment A, and dipoles J that are in segment B. Dipole I at time 0 or t, and dipoles J at the corresponding time t or 0. We have now measured the time-time cross-correlation function between the orientation of segment A at one time and segment B at time t earlier or later. That's a very detailed image of how the polymer chain is moving under different conditions. Of course, the synthetic chemists are going to tell us they're going to be, have to be very clever to invent an effective way of making the four needed chains so that they're all the same size and differ only in the orientation of two of the pieces. Nonetheless, there is the experiment, and it gives us, from a set of dielectric relaxation functions, the correlation function of the segmental orientations, the cross-correlation function, not the single-piece correlation function. That's it for today. Based on the paper, Polymer Segmental Cross Correlations from Dielectric Relaxation Spectra of Block Copolymers, a paper by Professor George Phillies, published in Physical Review E, Volume 84, Paper 011807. <laughs>